Hello everyone, Craig here. Welcome to another edition of the podcast, Tell Craig Your Story. I've had an absolutely amazing time during my two-week vacation for Chinese New Year. I was lucky enough to go to Japan and see Queen with Adam Lambert. And my dad always tells me about how Freddie Mercury and Queen was one of his favorite shows of all time. They just played hit after hit. Then I was lucky enough to go on tour with the rock band Journey. And what an unbelievable experience it was to be able to be a guest. I was lucky enough to meet the famous boxing promoter Don King. And hopefully I can get back there in the summertime and do some interviews. Today we'll be speaking with Big Sam. Now this was recorded live in Shenzhen the day after the MKW Bash at the Bay and Big Sam was in one of the main event matches on that card. Now, Big Sam is an international wrestler who has wrestled in many countries and tells an amazing story about his time in Nepal. And we take a deep dive into Big Sam's wrestling career. But before we go, please go to our website. We're at Podbean. Tell Craig Your Story at podbean.com. We have a link tree there which tells you where Tell Craig Your Story podcast is streaming. We are on all the major streaming services. We also have a YouTube account. Make sure you're subscribing and liking to get all the latest updates at Tell Craig Your Story. All right, here we go. This is my chat with English-born wrestler Big Sam on Tell Craig Your Story podcast. Hi, Big Sam. How are you doing today? Well, hello, and thank you for having me on your uh, interview podcast. No, thank I'm you. I'm doing okay. As of uh, yesterday, <coughs> I'm now feeling better from wrestling my match last night in Shenzhen. Yes, and you were yes. saying before that you got a bit of a sore throat. Is yeah, it? so sorry if you have to listen to my horrible <laughs> voice today, but yeah, it's very croaky. I was shouting. I was very vocal last night in my wrestling match, having to shout at the fans, shout at my opponent, hmm. just giving out verbal abuse to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and not just you, it was, yeah, so yes, you're in a... Yes, lovely Marie, my <laughs> Russian valley, my cheerleader, my inspiration when I get in the ring. That's the, that's the lady, yes. Always cheering and chanting my name as everybody's booing me and hissing me. <laughs> and we're trying to tell them that we're the good guys, but no, no, they try and go and support everybody I wrestle against. <laughs> MKW, it's the, like their WrestleMania. So tell us about how it all come about and how do you prepare for a big event like this? So with MKW, they've changed their strategy since COVID and now they're running less shows, but bigger shows. Right. Well, in the past, they ran more frequent shows, but not as big. So this was one of the bigger shows of the year that they were running. And usually well, in the past, as you know, they did it in Shanghai. This time they're doing it in Shenzhen because Shenzhen you usually get a good crowd. It's an easier audience to work actually in Shenzhen generally. The problem this time was the time of the year. Now, as you know, Chinese New Year's beginning and Shenzhen is a migrant city. Right. So many people leave the city. They all come from different provinces, including Hunan and Jiangsu, uh, Jiangxi. And so in the past couple of days, many of them have been heading towards the train stations and the airports and flying back home. <laughs> so who's ever's left? I mean, we look out this window now of this hotel and you see the streets are quite empty in traffic. Usually in Shenzhen, you couldn't be driving down the streets without hitting traffic every, every 200 yards. Yeah. Very different. So the problem is we couldn't do as much sales with the tickets as we had hoped. Mm. But we did better than we expected at the beginning. We, you know, we got a little bit panicky because the ticket sales were pretty low. Mm. But last night you saw there, we had, we had kind of a decent Yeah, audience, it was a good I'd crowd, say. yeah. Yeah, good crowd. I'm very vocal, which I like. Yeah. Sometimes you could have a crowd of 200 people who are very loud than better than a crowd of 1,000 who are quiet. Yes. Yeah, so it was a really good crowd. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And how this, okay, how this show all came about and why... Eight, well, one thing we're doing is looking for sponsors. And so as you see, we got sponsors, you see advertisements on the walls and that. Mm. And so they all come together and they agree on dates, agree what's going to be done. Many little things go on that not a lot of people from the outside do not see. I mean, there was a meet and greet for VIPs where they got to meet some of the wrestlers and that. 
And there's also, you have to go and do production, interviews. Yes. I mean, I was on camera being interviewed about, I don't know, they told me it was a documentary or mockumentary or something. I was being interviewed with many questions as well. And mm. I mean, that was put on me last minute as well when I got to the show. Yeah, right. So I was kind of caught off guard. Usually I mentally prepare myself and I try and look a bit decent when I'm going on camera. Right. But yeah, so the, they had me there in a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to preparing for this show, luckily there was quite another time, because I also wrestled in other promotions in China. Yes. There was kind of a, about a one, one and a half month break. And I actually turned down a wrestling show a week before this show. It was nowhere near as big as this show. Hmm. It was mostly in a, like an exhibition. It wasn't going to be a proper professional wrestling. It was going to be more in a kickboxing room, which is a hard mm. floor. And I didn't, want to, I didn't want to risk hurting myself, bruising myself. Yeah. So I cancelled that. And it was good money, to be honest, they were offering me. Hmm. Yeah, because it kind of got desperate because I kept saying, no, no, no. And right. I told them, I said, I'd only do it for this figure. And they came back and said, we'll do it for that figure. Hmm. And then I thought, well, I've really put my foot in it now. If I've got to bite the bullet and do it. But luckily, it, when there was someone out, the flight ticket got cancelled. The right. show. Yeah, so that was a bit of a blessing in disguise because I, I didn't want to. I, I hate for a guy who travels a lot, I hate flying. Yes. I absolutely hate flying and not fear or anything like that. I just feel we get shoved into planes like cows going to slaughter. <laughs> As humans, we create this fantastic thing of flying and then we make the whole experience terrible. We go into the airports, security checks, overpriced crap food. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a horrible experience and uh, yeah i get wound up when i see people posting pictures of them at the airport and like how excited they are to fly and i hate it absolutely despise flying <laughs> I, I drive in china All right and i will drive rather than fly if it's possible interesting yeah hmm. i mean i've driven all the way into changsha i've driven all the way like up to the um, uh, near sichuan province right. i've driven over to that direction yeah rather than flying yeah <laughs> Yeah, because I, 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 when I'm in my car, I, you know, pack sandwiches, I can drive, I've got music, got it. I've got my own comfort. I have a big SUV, so I've got the room. Uh, flying, I just do not enjoy the, and I can take as much luggage as I want. The show, Shenzhen, preparing. We got a training facility in Foshan, which is near Guangzhou. Mm. Yeah. And that's with, again, with another promotion. A lot of the wrestlers you saw last night train and wrestle for KOPW. That ring that broke last night was the ring I trained. For. Right. Yeah. So that ring, um, that was a bit of a headache. We had a bit of a... Now that you've talked about it, like, how did that happen? Like, Was it in the first match or was it just wear and tear? I'm not totally sure, but <laughs> okay, I'm going to upset a lot of hardcore wrestling fans <laughs> who believe in kayfabe and that. But for people who want to know, a wrestling ring is a metal frame. Yes, and on top of that is wood, planks of wood, mm. okay? And on top of that is maybe an inch of foam, and that's your ring yeah. with a mat over the top. So you are landing on foam, but supporting that foam are wooden planks. And depending on where people land in the ring, generally we work to the center of the ring. Mm. Like think of it as theater. You play to the center of the stage. All dramatic stuff happens in the center. I can hear people now screaming, Sam, stop telling me. <laughs> my... So the ring breaks because the planks of wood underneath, which mm. support everything on the metal frame and divide the, the foam and the metal frame, they break. And mm. they do break generally after wear and tear. I think this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. And today they've just bounced too much on those wooden planks and they just gave in today. And the problem is then the support then transfers to another plank of wood. And all the, the stress goes to Got it. And it starts. So it was gradually breaking throughout the show. Mm. And by the time it got to my match, and I was second to last match. Yeah. The ring, half the ring had been damaged. I mean, they were coming back at the talent. Like, we had almost like a map on the wall. Whereabouts of the ring? Oh, yeah. Don't do the big drops. And when you're running in the ring, obviously, it's better to run on a flat surface. It was like running on sand at some point. Yeah, know, right. Just sinking in because of where the, the planks of wood's gone down. You could see that it looked like a jumping castle, like when so you were going. <laughs> when I got into the ring, I walked around the ring. What right. we were doing was using our feet to measure where not to do the moves. Mm. Yeah. That's so we, me and my opponent is absolutely professional. Mm. We chain, we called the match in the ring. Mm. That means we planned little bits and then start speaking to each other in the ring, saying what to do because we had to adjust so much. And my my opponent Yoshi Tatsu, he's a professional wrestler. This is his career, his life. Yeah, he, Japanese coming right? over here to wrestle this small show in Middle Kingdom wrestling. 
I'll make this comparison. For me, it was an honor. Imagine you're a school soccer team and you get to play your favorite club. You get to play a big club like Manchester City, for example. Yeah. My football team, just for everybody out there. <laughs> and don't say I'm a glory hunter. My dad is from Manchester, Lancashire. Come on. So that's why we go that direction, okay? Yeah. That's why I'm a manager. Otherwise, I would have ended up Sheffield Wednesday because of my mother. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. So for him, he came in over here. It was like a learning experience for me. And you see the difference when you work with someone like that professional. And I'm not just saying that like a cliche. I woke up this morning with no bruises, no marks. Yeah. I, I'm after this interview podcast, I'm going to go to the gym and go swimming at the hotel. Yeah, right. Usually after a show, I'm, I'm lying, you know, lying on the sofa tending to my bruises and wounds and you know <laughs> aching back necks a bit twisted no i'm i'm really well mm. i'm really good like i i'm a big guy mm. so i was worried about my cardio because he wanted to do quite a bit in the mat yeah yeah and i was like i, I i'm just told him honest i said my cardio <laughs> is i was going to use a different word there but <laughs> not so good let's put it that way right. yeah not so good and you know i thought god I need to work on that but i surprised myself in that mm. match yeah and uh, some of the stuff didn't look pretty sloppy because we adjusted and we we're calling stuff if we were we had a proper solid ring and we went for the the original plan i think it would have been e easily mm. my best match ever so easily that would have been my best match if we didn't everything originally planned yeah right but there was a few hiccups on both sides which we both admit but then again we got to you got to work with what you got a mm. broken ring that's, that's that's the stage. That's what we're working with. Yeah. Anyway, back to the original question of how about preparing. Usually we train when we can. We haven't been training so much because we are Christmas and the Western January 1st New Year. Hmm. And a lot of the times I just go to the gym and work out. The bigger guy. So sometimes it's just easier just to just be a brick. <laughs> just be the wall. Just be be the tank yeah yeah just be the tank of the thing and half the battle one is on appearance i come out and it's like e64 265 270 pounds for the metric system 194 centimeters tall <laughs> and about 120 kg give or take that's half the battle one hence the name yeah big well actually the story was i was going to have to play on my uh my ancestry is just viking right yeah so my mum, when she retired, started playing around, did all the DNA tests and that. We found out we're mostly Norwegian. Right. We settled in York, which is where my mum's from. Interesting. Yeah, because that was the, the, the Viking capital of the United Kingdom. Right. Was York. Yeah. Well, before I start a history lesson on this, well, I'll, I'll skip that. But basically, yeah, I'm a Viking accessory. So I went with the wrestling name, Von Odin. Oh, right. But in Asia... That was very hard for them to pronounce. Yes. So when I first, I was psyching myself for my first wrestling show. You know, I got the music playing. I said, here we go. Are they going to say it? And I mean, four guys in the ring. And everyone just kept calling me by my nickname, Big Sam. Right. And, and uh, what, 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 uh, uh, Big yeah. Sam, Big <laughs> Sam. And I thought, I'm just, that's, That'll do. That, that's <laughs> going to be the name. And I thought, God, it doesn't even sound fantastic. It's just like my nickname. Everyone's been calling me that, but... It stuck, and what I found is everyone can say it. Yeah. I can meet people who are not native English because they don't even know English, and they can say Big Sam. Wherever you go in Asia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anywhere. Anywhere. Mm. It's like the easiest two things to say for them, and I think, oh, that's perfect now. Now people know it. And they remember. And Yes, like you just said, they remember. Like Von Odin, maybe if you don't understanding of that type of Viking mythology culture, hmm. you'd be, oh, was it old, old, old war? Yeah, yeah, you, you know, they wouldn't understand or remember it probably as easy. Hmm. Big Sam, yeah. That's really interesting. I wanted to get back to it, and you, you said before kayfabe, and I know some hardcore wrestlers fans don't like this, but how much- I saw it last night. Oh, yeah. There were some very hardcore when wrestling I, fans there. Yeah, when I, well, when I walk backstage, I've, I mean, you saw when, you saw me last night. For those who don't saw me, when I go out there, you, you think I'm one of the worst people ever. You think I'm some type of everything that you believe people despise in Western society. I'm slapped it and I just took it and I did. <laughs> yes. I come out as this arrogant, you could almost say a far right, maybe a poster boy for white supremacy type of character. <laughs> and people are booing and I can shout whatever. I can be derogatory towards them. I can insult them. And, you know, some people take it very seriously. I can mm. see some fans like 
back by what they say to me. I mean, they'll say stuff like, you suck, and I'll say, yeah, your mother showed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're saying. Yeah, and I can play with them and that type of thing. And, you know, I'm British. We're colonizers. This is why everything's better over here. I'm the king of China. So obviously, I'm your king. I, my opponent was Japanese. And obviously, China and Japan having a very yes. sensitive history. It was easy for me to say, he's Japanese. I should be your hero. <laughs> I'm your hero. And, you know, there's uh, there were these group of white guys who were booing me. And I said, I'm the only white wrestler on this show. <laughs> I, I'm your savior. <laughs> <laughs> you know i know with this council culture but again with wrestling it's like acting you can kind of get yeah. away with it you could play that that line mm. but then when i walk backstage it, you get more of the the character you're seeing now the real me like right but some people are not like that in wrestling and they will stay in character all the way through japanese are very serious about it mm. afterwards yoshi my opponent won't go near me even right. outside Right. Don't let the fans see him talking to me. Got it. Yeah. Distance. And he's very strict about it, and I respect it, so I kept my distance. I didn't need to be told because I saw it, because I was talking to somebody outside, and he came out, saw me, and just turned around and walked off. Mm. And I thought, well, have I upset him? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's just that's these... Just a way. After, heel, oh, heel. Yeah, look, afterwards, we had dinner together, and, he, you know, best friends. Yeah. With the fans there, No. Very mm. kept your distance. I oh, but I like that boat. Like that, that's the old and school wrestling a, there way. Was a female Japanese wrestler last night, H Hibiscus Me, and she played like a silent hill. Oh my like god! Wow! Like a nurse. That was. A nurse. She had the bandage around the faces, Ooh. and maybe it was a patient, a nurse. I couldn't. Yeah. Remember. And backstage, she's crawling around. I'm like, really I'm like me i'm uh, i'm joking about like when my music's playing i'm, I'm doing a little <laughs> dance before i walk out through the doors and, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm like psyching myself up and i'm like to tell the guys i said okay time to be a prick and then i walk out through the <laughs> curtains and just be the prick yeah, yeah. yeah but no they're doing it all backstage and <sighs> you know and her character doesn't talk not vocal so mm. she'll talk to you and i'm like Wow, wow, you really take this. Uh, yeah, serious. Method actor. Yeah, that's the one. Where, where you're in the character yes. all the time. Yes. Oh, that's what they were like. That's so we really, it's really old school. It, it is very, very old school. Mm. You, you got to respect it. Yeah. But sometimes it could be a little bit, especially with someone like me, it could be a little bit awkward. No, you're all right. And like the look at, like this, this girl is looking at me and <laughs> she's trying to intimidate me. And I'm like, you know, I. <laughs> Shall I do one of my one-liners about it? Yeah. You know what? No, no. You're a guest here. I'll be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If this is you, do it. So have you been to Japan to wrestle? I and have been as, to Japan to wrestle. Did you have to do the same thing? Oh. Like stay in character or? No. People like to talk to me. Right. And I, I like talking to people. Yeah. I can't be a complete prick all my life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I only, I'm a paid prick. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd have your slash tires and your, yeah, you'd be. Yeah. yeah. Waiting for you at the car park. You know, they always, we have this joke, they say, yeah. the guys who play the bad guys in wrestling are the nicest guys in real life. Interesting. I mean, Nepal. I wrestled in Nepal. I, I went against their hero, and I was the champion of China representing the, the company. So I went to Nepal, and we had a great stadium. Mm. Had about probably one of the biggest live audiences I've ever worked in front of, mm. close to 2,000 people. And I hit my finishing move, the tombstone, which is like a vert. I drop them on the head in a vert from a vertical position. Yeah. And I pin him one, two, three. Now I've been cheating throughout this match. I have been despicable. <laughs> I have been, and I have been that arrogant bugger, absolute horrible man. Yeah. You know, I make Trump look weak in comparison. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I was over the top there. Yeah. And at the end of it, now in Nepal, they have a red spot on their head. And it's like their connection to God. Well, this this big white guy called Big Sam, <laughs> after pinning him, got his thumb. I swiped it on his head, mm -hmm. and then I put it on myself, and the whole place <laughs> erupted. <laughs> I, we had, I know my manager was Chairman Al, the Hong Kong guy you saw. Like right, that. right. <laughs> they were throwing bottles of water at us. We had uh, stools, plastic stools, that is. And uh, a motorbike helmet was caught on camera. Didn't oh, my it? God. They couldn't reach us because we had quite a distance from the audience. But yeah. well, they were throwing and shouting. And I was like, oh, bugger, I think I've just collapsed. Wow. Yeah. But I had that 1980s real wrestling. 
vibe for Phil. Out. we had to we had to be escorted out and wow one well, thing is don't touch the women what do i do when i'm walking out the ring and i says it's gorgeous neat police woman i said take about hand six time for you to come with a real man like this i said not like these Midgets, these little brown midgets, and they're all just big. rubbing it in a, a little bit more. Yeah, rubbing it off a well, well, I'm already in it. I'm just going to throw the fuel in the fire. There's no way oh, of fixing man. this. I'm just going to go all out. <laughs> and we went backstage and that, and they had to keep me separate. And so there was one point, maybe about ooh, 10, 15 minutes after getting backstage. And my opponent hadn't come backstage yet. <laughs> and then he apparently he was in the next room. Then some guy comes through the curtain to me and says, Hey, Sam, yeah. You might want to come and uh, check this out. What? Says uh, his mum and dad are with him, my opponent. And he's backstage in the next room. I said, oh, yeah. You know, and usually in wrestling, you go backstage. Hey, how was it? I was all right. You okay? Yeah. Did it? Yeah. yeah. How was it? Yeah. We, you could work on this. But yeah, everything's good. Well, my head around the corner and his mum is bellowing, crying, like uh, screaming, what? almost crying. No. I'm hearing it. And I, I, I was like, oh, 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 oh what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> and my opponent sees me, like, with my head around the corner. Mm. And he says, oh, Sam, come, 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 come. Really nice guy. Mm. Really down to type of people I like. Yeah. yeah. Come over. I said, uh, you okay? And his mom is hugging him around the way. Tears are coming oh, down no. his eyes and stuff. And, you know, she thought I actually hurt him. Yeah. And he had to kind of show his mom that we're okay in real life. We're not like, we. I don't really hate him. I never said that about his wife or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. I never said, yeah, I never said those messages I claimed I did at the promo <laughs> to his wife and stuff like that. Like and I shake his hand and his wife shake his hand and she wouldn't let go of my hand. Wow. I'm like, thinking to myself, she can let go now. He's gonna... Yeah. And I'm like, trying to walk away, she's holding on tight. And I'm like, what do I do from here? God damn. Wow. <laughs> a friend whispered in the ear, you've still got the red spot on your head. <laughs> You still got the red spot on your head. And that's what the red spot she gave him and it's sticking on my head now. So no, so, you know, me trying to break the mood, I thought another joke. So, maybe she sees me as her new son. <laughs> no, that did not go down well. That went down like a lead balloon. Yeah. Um, but my so my next question is, did they invite you back? So they all found me on Facebook. Right. All the crowd. And they legit due to restrictions of Facebook in China. I can't answer all these messages. Oh, right. So they went and found my mum. Oh. And they started messaging. Wow. Me. Oh, yeah. My mum, like, said, Sam, yeah? Obviously, what is going on? What, what happened in Nepal? I said, what? She goes, I've got all these people, I can't even pronounce their names, adding me on, on, on Facebook. And uh, they're saying, you know, about you being a very bad lad, and I raised you wrong, and, and that you, you're this, you're that, and... You know, you're, you're a terrible person. And this is, I tell you, I had to explain everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, you're going to cause an, an incident. <laughs> incident. That's you'll probably right. collapse for <laughs> these uh, trade relations. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Wow. What a story. But then, then yeah, it all yeah. turned around. So when I did get on Facebook, like a couple of months later, a few months later, you know, so under all my pictures, there'll be pictures of me and they'll be like, this man is a bad man. This guy is cheats in wrestling. He is dishonest. <laughs> right. There was an instance where I saved a dog in China. You know, there's lots of strays in that. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I, I saved a dog and I've, I've posted a picture seeing if anybody, after I've got the dog fixed and ready to go, oh wow, would anybody like to adopt it? They saw that and it was just like 180. You are right. now a good man, my sir. Uh, you are a very right. kind man, yes. I'm glad. We got you all wrong. Yeah. They started working it all out. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. What an amazing story. Just 180 flip. I saw that, just posting now. That's it. I went on, then I came back, and I, my, my social media said, you got all these notifications. Mm. And I went on, then I could see half these people I don't even know. With names looks like someone's <laughs> banged the keyboard. And I looked. <laughs> And I looked at the comments, I looked at what they've written about, you know, and they were like all positive and thanking me. And I yeah. thought, well, there it is. There it is. Yeah. So, yeah, would they invite me back? There's interest because they want the revenge. <laughs> right, they yes. Revenge. Yeah. So it, maybe you could. Over time, a lot of it died off, especially during COVID. Right. Interesting me. But there's a few people keeping contact with me. 
Yeah. And they're very nice. Now, when I was in Nepal, one of my good friends who I went to university is is from Nepal. Mm. And he knew all about pro wrestling. Yeah. And uh, the people and the fans, it's like here you have people who are kind of like very well educated, mm. who are open minded, open to the world. And then you got more of the closed minded people and that. In this case, it was the closed minded people who went after me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Who didn't have a fully understanding of what was going on in pro wrestling. And they, they basically, what they see is what they believed. Right. Yeah. Wow. So when my friend picked me up and took me out, he was like, oh, telling me all the stories of what fans were saying around him <laughs> about me. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, he remembers me from university being this like completely different character. Yes, he yes. For who I am. Yeah. Yeah, not the character you see in the ring. All right. And people like say to me like, you know, maybe you could change your character and stuff like that. They remember the character. Yeah, that's you, right. Yes. You sometimes remember more what I've said than what I did in the ring. Yeah. And I was the same. I remembered, couldn't remember your name, but the first time I saw you in Shanghai, I, I remembered you. And then when I saw you for the just after the lockdown at the Mao Life House in Shanghai, yeah. yep. And I saw you again, Big Sam. That's the one. So I remember when I wrestled in Shanghai as well. But I was again very vocal. Oh yes, that was a good match. That was a good match. Went with great flow. Mm. That ma- that was a really good show. I would say that was probably my favorite show of last year. Uh, it came out a bit of a difficult time because I had the news that my father was in hospital. My morale was a bit down, but after doing that Shanghai show, that was like a positive for me. Yeah, and uh, I could really uh, brought out the better person in me during the sad times that I was going through, the difficult times I was going through. Yeah, I, and. I, one thing I love about the the pro wrestling in Shanghai, a lot of people who were involved in that show I'm friends with, and they're very likable people. So it makes everything easy. Yes. What would you say? There was no real egos there. And that was the first time I got to wrestle Yoshi, who I wrestled last night. Right. Yeah. So that was my first introduction to him. And he was impressed with me, which obviously strokes my ego. And when he wanted to come back to China, his agent requested, Big Sam. I yeah, was right. A different match last night. You saw there was a four versus four match. Mm. Originally, that was going to be five versus five. Mm. And I was going to be the captain of the evil foreigners. Your stable. That's it. The stable. Yeah. Right. But actually, the real name now is the Regnant Stable. Right. Yeah. Regnant means ruling for anybody who's asking right. what that means. Yeah. Because it keeps more the direct translation of what we say in Chinese of it. But yeah, we call ourselves the Regnant Stable. But at the beginning, we just call ourselves a stable. Right. But we're on a wrestling website and they told me the stable is too basically, how would I say, generic. And it interferes with their database. Mm. Or so give me a I thought of a word and I thought I thought of like kingdoms because I think of power yes I, I'm into that type of history mm. and I was like a ruling kingdom the ruling stable and I was like read, and I read this line the regnant king and I thought yes yes that's the, <laughs> that's the one that's the word yes the regnant stable so yeah the regnant stable so it wasn't I, I thought of what can make something very very top heelish and I thought put foreigners in there yes i thought make it worse yeah. hong kong manager <laughs> he's had to go overseas to import yeah. foreign talent <laughs> and also Al 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 sometimes goes to japan and he's involved mm. with those two japanese wrestlers right and they're a group in japan right. so it's like <laughs> yes. a family almost yes yeah but yeah i was meant to lead that team and right. i was going to go against another d- former wwe guy a chinese wrestler called wang bing Yes, Wang Bing. Mm. His WWE name, I believe, was Tian Bin. He he mostly stayed on the NXT show. Oh, okay. And that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's got a Wikipedia page, so I don't know how much that matters, but you can mm. check him up on there. And he was he was been released by WWE now. He's doing something with Japanese wrestling. Right. But he was going to work that show and he was going to be captain of the Chinese team and I was the evil foreign team. Right. Yeah. And he's about my size. Not as heavy, but he, he's almost eye, eye level with me. Right. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He's a big, big boy. He's big. Yeah. He's he's very tall. Yeah. I think he's like one ninety. Mm. So that's about six three. With Yoshi, how much did you talk before the match, and and how much? Well, this is amazing. When you work <clears throat> with someone who's a professional. He came to the show, and usually when he someone of his expertise, he should direct the match. Mm. 
And I said to Yoshi, do you have any ideas? And he's like, oh, no ideas. I'm very busy. I'm tired. Because he wrestles a lot right. in Japan. And I said, well, I've got a couple of ideas. And he said, mm. tell me them. I told him. And he says, especially the ending. He goes, I like it. Stick with it. Because he's a big boy too. I didn't realize how big he was. Put on a lot of weight. Mm. Yeah, he, he's 100 kg, 220 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he wasn't always like that. No, but no, no. Yeah. no. He, he's so, actually so. broke his neck. Oh, got you it. You put the weight on. Got it. He's, yeah. And that he's in his 40s now. I think he's 44, 45. Mm. Sorry, Yoshi, if you're not 44, 45. <laughs> but I remember hearing that somewhere. Yeah. And so when you get older, it's not so easy to shift the weight. Yes. Yeah. And when you've got a broken neck, he's very he's very careful with everything. Well, obviously, if you break your neck, you probably are going to be a bit more cautious, especially doing pro wrestling. Yes. And with you speaking as well, you have an, it's almost like a natural way of speaking. Has that always been the case ever since you started wrestling? Doing a promo and is very important in wrestling and being able to speak to the crowd like when they're shouting out insults. So have you always had that ability to sort of do that? So I take that as a compliment what you just said. No, no. It's kind of shy at first. Right. But what it is, is like a feeling. So when I go out through those curtains, I change. Yes. Total change. You know, mm. as I said before, I'll say to the guys, okay, ta- when my music hits, I'll tell them something and say, you know, it's time for me to be a prick. And I'll go out there <laughs> and like this. And I say, you know, I say, I see how many people I can upset today. And yeah. I walk out there. And I transform. And I always joke, I said, like the way I am with women when I go to a crowd, I'm like, this is a real man, you know, like this. Said, <laughs> you know, and they'll be sitting next to her boyfriend and stuff <laughs> like this. And I said, don't worry, mate, you can watch. You know, say stuff like this, you know. And I, like sometimes I go backstage, but how on earth have I just said yeah. that? <laughs> like I jokingly said, like I said to Maria, I said, sometimes I wish I had the confidence of Big Sam. Yeah. <laughs> But not in real life. I wish I had, sometimes I wish I could be that guy in real life. Yeah. To just throw, you know, speak to people like that. Sometimes, you know, when I come, when someone upsets me and stuff like this. Yeah. And I think when I can go out there, I come, there, I come backstage, I'm like, phew, mellowed out and stuff. But do you, you know, plan what you're going to say? No. No, it just comes. All about feeling. Right. All about how I, how I am at that But that's time. a talent. That, that is a talent. Like, yeah, not a, many... lot, a lot of what you saw last night, mm. and I'm not exaggerating. I'm going to say it now from the speaking and what you saw in the ring. Hmm. I'm going to say about 80% was called on the spot in call. That was it. That was it. The beginning was so slow of my match. Did you see? Yeah. I get outside two minutes. Take a long time. Because the crowd are making noise. As long as the crowd's making noise, keep it, they'll keep it going. Yeah. Keep it going. When the crowd dips down, you start. Yes. So I follow the crowd. And when they're speaking and shouting at me, you know, like the referee, the first, what I do is I have a few things in my head, remember. So I said to the referee, it's first time work with this referee and he's come from overseas. I say, where are you from? Where are you from? I've not seen you before. And he's like, I'm from Italy. And oh, said, yes. Sir. You're the reason I voted Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and because of the way, like, everything's portrayed in the media, Brexit's seen as, like, some type of, E- not evil, but very, you know, conservative and uh, yes. very old school viewing. And if you're a Brexit supporter, you're seen as kind of a, a more extreme right type of person yes. or politically, whatever. So you just play to that. Got it. Yeah. And you can see the audiences and you can just kind of work out where they are on the spectrum. I mean, a lot of young people today think they're very politically active by sharing an article, for a Guardian article on Facebook and thinking that's them done politically. Yes. <laughs> Without <laughs> actually knowing what's going on there. So they're the easiest people to wind up. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> they know their XYZs, but don't know their ABCs. Yeah. 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 Japan, Taiwan. Yeah, you've got the whole the whole fuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, the foreigners will be the ones who want to shout at me. Right. And a lot of them want it because they know I can, I'll shout back at them. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to where you were born. Correct me if I'm wrong. Chester, England? I was born in Chester, England, correct. There you go. So for our Australian listeners, the international, where, whereabouts is that in England? Whereabouts in England? Okay. So you have the country of Wales. Oh, yes. It's on the Welsh border, just below Liverpool, Manchester. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Daniel Craig, the James Bond. Oh, yes. He's from Chester. Oh, there you go. There you go. Wow. Yeah. That's a big claim to fame. And were your parents involved in wrestling? Were they involved in entertainment? Not at all. Sports? So my mum is from Barnsley in Yorkshire. Right. She was from a proper working class background. Right. Yeah. The eldest of, I think, five kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So was it sports or was it well, just? If you've yeah, yeah, this, yeah. So my dad, he's from Lancashire. Yep, near Manchester. Failsworth, for those who know any uh, geography of the UK. My parents met overseas. So my dad, he went to South Africa in the 70s. Mm. He was a policeman. Then he got a job in Australia. Oh, yeah. wow. Brisbane. Come on. Yeah. He moved, went to Brisbane with his best friend who settled in Brisbane, Australia. Mm. Yeah. I got relatives in Australia and New Zealand, by the way. Oh, there you go. Yeah. During the 70s, a lot of my family migrated because England was going through a rough time economically and there was that big immigration policy that australia was promoting at that time right and a lot of our family took the opportunity and went there so i have family in australia oh there you go and uh, but my mom and dad met in new zealand wow yeah and that's a story as well yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, don't know how that'll be taken back in the day they were seen as heroes today i don't know because it involved maoris but anyway uh, they were in the police force now my mom is black brown belt judo before she damaged her back yeah, she's a tough cookie, my mum. You know, right. they, she's been stabbed. Yeah, straight through the hand as well. Knife went straight through it by an Irish woman in New Zealand <laughs> during the seventies. What are the odds? Oh, when uh, she came back to England, she did. When, when she met my father in New Zealand, they came back to England. They thought, "Ooh, we'll sell back in England, a bit of peace and quiet." Then the miners' strike began in oh, England, which was damn. very big in the eighties for people who were, who were who were young and want to know about that. You don't have to be political to know about that story, and it's very interesting if you ever get to read about it. Hmm. But yes, he came back during the miners' strike. And my dad's a policeman, and my mum, she was how she's a mother. She's a she became a housewife, hmm. and she never went back into police force after that. Mm. Instead, my mum went on to achieve two master degrees and went into the government. Wow. Yeah. What a change. Very big change. Smart cookie. Oh, yeah. She became, <laughs> she became the breadwinner. Right. Yeah. But my dad, he was very much frontline police force. Mm. Yeah. So was the... Firearms uh, officer, if anybody's wondering. Right. He was firearms and traffic. It's interesting. So growing up near Manchester then, obviously, he'd be foot playing football. Was oh, he? I was a big soccer player. Yeah. Player, yeah. Football, but yeah, soccer. So for you, like, where does wrestling and... When I was seven years old, I went round to my friend's house and him and his dad kept doing these wrestling quotes, but I didn't know at the time, Hulk Hogan, a macho man. And, you know, I I questioned where it came from and they put it on the TV (laughs) and I watched it and we just basically got hooked from there. That Mm. was like, that was it. That was like the first blast of heroin, you know, I dicked afterwards and I just got more access to and i just kept watching it and watching it and doing backyard wrestling with my friends and <laughs> putting the cat in a headlock and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> it just grew on me i went into amateur wrestling like the olympic style mm. yeah because i couldn't find any pro wrestling school because it's not so big in the united kingdom right. like it is in the usa so i was doing wrestling in the amateur wrestling in the united kingdom and i was good at it like i'm not blowing my own trumpet i was good at it yeah i'm, I'm a strong kid Bit of a country boy, actually. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were raised with animals and stuff like that. So that natural strength. My mum and dad are strong people. Right. Like, when I was, I remember being about 14, 15, and like grabbing my mum, putting her in a headlock, (laughs) joking, joking, (laughs) jokingly. She probably would have turned you around, spun you around. I remember I was watching TV and I'm lying on the floor, and she came behind me, sneaked up, and she put me in a chokehold. And I'm not lying. I've been a bouncer later on in my life, and I've been in conflict. It felt like a man doing it, like a big man doing it. That was, it was such a tight lock. And I, well, now I might be able to fight out of it. I've got size. But back then I thought, God, you know, my eyes went in the back of my head. Tapping out. Tapping out. I didn't know about (laughs) tapping out then. I got, (laughs) as you let go. I remember that. I remember that. God. And when I turned around, it was my mum. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. This cuz I hear the stories about her. Don't miss but as a kid I never got that. My mum mm. I was my mum worshiped the ground I walked on. Yeah. Worshiped it. Whatever you want, Sammy. You know whatever, you know, I would wake her up and she'd make me breakfast and mm. she'd do my washing without even second the, the bloody could almost choke me out when I was in my teens, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a degree, didn't you? I got my degree. One yeah. one one at home and one in yes, China. Sure. Yes, yes, correct. Right. Yeah. That's wrestling what brought just... me to China. Right. Was well, that, that was going to be one of my next. So after amateur wrestling, I ended up doing it occasionally. I wasn't going into shows, any, uh, sorry, shows, tournaments anymore then. Right. I, I can't, when I got older, I didn't want to do traveling, uh, getting up super early, going to somewhere, and you have to make weight and stuff like that. So your diet was all over the place. Right. 
yeah but when i found pro wrestling and i went into that again sorry guys i'm going to upset of quite a few wrestlers out there <laughs> in when you do greco-roman wrestling or freestyle wrestling you work with the right arm and right leg in pro wrestling you work left ah, leg interesting yeah what is it? I knew you that was going to be a question, <laughs> and I've already got the answer for you. Most people are right-handed, so you want to be. So if you damage your hand in pro wrestling, um, at least you can still write with your right hand. Got it. You can still do more stuff with your right side because um, most people are naturally right-handed. Right. Yeah. And I've heard some interviews before how you were saying that, and you just said that pro wrestling wasn't really popular in England. Yeah. It is now. Well, there's a whole just, NXT. Like, and, as I said, yeah. it's sod's law. So mm. when I left the wrestling scene in the UK, when I got into pro wrestling, I, I was not in it that long, to be honest, mm. give or take a year and a half. Right. But that'll give you enough of the basic oh, yeah. training and but they say you know your first time you take a bump in the ring whether or not you want to continue doing this and i saw people take one bump in the ring and they got up and said no this isn't for me how was your first match can you remember absolutely awful <laughs> Right. Again, I just got in character work, and it was a Royal Rumble. Rumble. Oh, yeah. Battle Battle Royal. Royal. Yeah. So we all came into the ring. We all just start off. So what they do usually, the more expertise guys, will try and pick on the newer guy. Right. Pin him down and chop him and take beats. So they hit him a little bit harder, the, the rookies or whatever they call them. Yeah. But introduction. Yeah. But me being got size and an amateur wrestling background, I was always, they were a little bit weird. Right. Which I would have taken it. But you know, and I wouldn't. I don't think I would have been an idiot and gone and shoot. Actually, legit, gone and wrestled them and that. Hmm. But they always put it across their mind that I could embarrass them if I. Well, they thought I could probably embarrass them. You know, they're trying to be these big stars, and then this new guy comes in and takes their legs from under them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So where does coming into China fit in? Because okay, so it? because it's not every day that you decide you go from England to China. You've stayed here for so long now. So what was the main reason to start off with? So the university I was at, they were building a special partnership with the Chinese university. And I heard about it and I didn't really care about it, if you want the truth. China, I was never too much interested in Asia honestly speaking hmm. i was more interested in europe and africa no you're right yeah i got a letter through the post and my dad opened it and it was from my university you know and i was like oh god have i done anything? you know i was a bit <laughs> you know i'm i'm, 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 I'm one of those guys you could say i was an in-betweener in school like right. a tv series yeah. wasn't the popular but i wasn't the the unpopular person i was yeah. always in between and the university letter said oh because of my attendance and grades that i could be invited to take part in this delegation in china i'd have to go for an interview mm. but would i be interested i could be selected when i said oh that's interesting he says that's a different part of the world isn't it you know china no no i don't think none of our family have ever been that far i think the closest from my granddad during the second world war when he went into burma fight the japanese right yeah and so my dad says why don't you try it you know they're gonna pay for everything mm. All right, applied, sent it, and then the, the university contacted me and said, hey, Sam, come in for a quick interview. And I went in there with uh, two, I think it was one or two other people with me, and they were going to choose one of us to be part of the delegation. Mm. And so we gave the interview, and then they said afterwards, well, I can't remember if it was a couple of days later, they said, Sam, we want you to come to China with us. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, oh, now I've done it. And I've seen these long flights. and I've Yeah. <laughs> And I, I'm getting on that plane and people are like, oh, when you're on this delegation, in the mornings you're going to have classes, learn about Chinese, learn about business, learn about culture, all these different classes. And then in the afternoon, they want us to go around talking with the students. You'd be put with groups of students of four and you will talk for like 40, 50 minutes, I think. I could be totally wrong. It could be half an hour each. Mm. But we had to talk with four or five different groups in the afternoon about anything. Like an English corner almost, you could say. Right. And so I got on that plane and we're saying, oh, we're going to learn Chinese. And, you know, we all like, ni hao, ni hao. Like that. That's what we've learned from Google Translate. Where <laughs> but then Ash Jeeves, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and so we're all on the plane. And then, you know, they listed to us Chinese couple next to me. And I looked and I said, I would, are we going to learn that? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounded nothing like, you know, we're learning like French and German, like yeah. high school. That what brought me. And that was to the city of Hangzhou. 
Hangzhou. Yeah. So what was your first impression of China? Honestly, we arrived in Hangzhou and it was murky skies, a lot more dull than what it is. And this was 2007. Right. I want to say October, November time in Hangzhou. So it was cooling down. Yeah. But I just felt, I felt it was dirty, honestly. Mm. Yeah. If that was my only impression of China after that trip I did, and I never came back to China, I'd probably be giving people a very full mm. impression of China of what I saw. Yes. Yeah. And we were shown around, but we're only shown around local places. And we got to spend a weekend in Shanghai. Now, Shanghai changed me a little bit. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I remember, like, a lot of us had food poisoning from, we had some dodgy seafood <laughs> right. that the school supplied. Yeah. And we started to recover. And they're like, what do you guys want to eat? I remember them saying on the bus, and I stood up and I saw Hooters. I said, let's go to Hooters. <laughs> and I think it's the one in Pudong. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went, Pooters. And we saw, they're asking the Chinese stuff. They're like, we could take you for a nice meal where we have good, right? And we're like, no, Hooters. <laughs> and, you know, we had this kind of like very wholesome Chinese lady showing our school around. <laughs> and we're like, we want to go to Hooters. <laughs> and they took us to the bus stop or took us into Hooters. And this wholesome Chinese lady who's paying for everything and that. Yeah. And like, all we were getting burgers and fries. Most of us have been, <laughs> we, we struggled with the canteen food. I mean, we, yeah. Because we were eating at the school of the the university and, mm. you know, they're getting on metal trays. We're like, God, this is like prison. Yeah. 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 And they're, they're dumping on rice and all, and everything's in oil base. And mm. some of the little girls with us were, um, vegetarians or vegans you know that that was starting to come in you don't know where it's going you don't know they're asking about the, what type of oil it is and obviously none of us knows Chinese. Like, yeah. and you got these chefs who's just like eh? Yeah. Eh? i and don't care just put on the plate. yeah but while we're in shanghai yeah we we, we went to who just like no this is our favorite place yeah we felt better when we went down by the bund Yes. And uh, Nanjing Road. Right. We came into our element. Right. We really came. It was a savior then, yeah, really. Yeah. So on the last day, the school's like giving us like kind of certificates for thank you for coming. This is what you've <laughs> achieved. Chinese culture class, stage one or whatever it was. Hmm. And then they said, oh, we've got other certificates. And what they've done, they asked the students who we've been talking with, who was their favorite person to talk with. Well, I was number one. Ah. Oh, so yeah, they, they enjoyed chatting to me. Came on the school, said, oh, if you ever want to come back over here, you could get like sponsorship, a scholarship. I think it was like a semester or a year, something like that. Mm. And I thought, I still had to finish my degree back in the UK. Mm. So I thought, yeah, put that in the back pocket. And, you know, they get on the plane and people are like, would you go back again? I said, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I am very westernized. I'm a creature, a creature of comforts these days. I don't, you know, I was like, oh, let's try to be wild and experimental. I've done all that. Yes. And a lot of the time I end up on the bad end of stuff. All right. When I go overseas, I always find it safe with the wrestling. Find something like an Irish bar and have bangers and mash. <laughs> what I also find in there, I'll find if, if I'm looking for company, yeah. that the the people in that place, usually in an expat a bar or an Irish bar or American fast food dine or something like that. Mm. TGIs, I remember I used to go to that in Korea. Yeah. You'd find people who speak English there. Got it. And I can communicate with. Mm. Even like the locals who go there who speak English, they're more willing to talk to you. Right. Yeah. yeah. But so when I came back to England after being in China, uh, I was like, finished my degree and I was thinking of all these different things to do. And I, my dad said, What do you want to do? And I said, I'm not honestly don't know. He says, Have a year in China, you got that scholarship. Mm. And I said, oh, I don't know if uh, there's things I enjoy and the things I didn't enjoy. And he says, Well, what did you see? Where were you? And he's like, you know, it's a big country, Sam. Hmm. And he says, you have you go to Great Wall? Yeah. See there, Beijing. How far is that? Two hour flight. He says, I'll pay it. It must be cheap. You know, it must be cheap. Is it domestic flights? Yeah. And I told him, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went back to China. I thought, I'll give it a go. He says, you know, that give yourself something to think about. Went over there. And while I was over there, Europe hit, Europe, the West, sorry, was struck by the economic mm. crisis. And so when my, fast forward, so when this year of the scholarship was coming up, I was like, oh God, there's no, uh, what am I going to do going back home now? And like my friends who I graduated with, some of them were being let off after one year mm. because the, they were suffering. And like, there was one scary situation where a friend of mine had just bought a house and then the job had to let him go. And you know, he was 
Just trying to find a work, yeah. Trying to find work, mm. trying to borrow some money to keep him. Yeah, yeah. Money. And I was talking to my dad about it and that. And he says, have you applied for a job in China? I said, D -d 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 never thought about it. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Yeah. And uh, I sent out a bunch of CVs and I got a call. I often, if I want to do an internship, paid internship. And so I took it. Mm. And that then led to opening doors to other jobs. Yeah. And that led me to coming down to Shenzhen. Right. And I worked and I found what I'd say is my real proper job in Shenzhen where I had a, a good livable wage. Yes. That was being taxed. I was legit. I had the real paperwork. I was had the proper visa. Mm. And I was here for many years. Yeah. Then I moved to Zhuhai. Again, change of job, better living environment. Mm. Bought myself a car. Nice. Yeah. So I got my, I really settled in now. I was going to marry a woman, actually, mm. and uh, we were settled down, but she ran off to this country that's cursing me called Australia. <laughs> oh, really? Well, her, her father <laughs> wanted to migrate to Australia. Right. Yes, yeah, she, she went out there, Melbourne, and she went out there to Melbourne. To, she went originally to help her father, and she ended up having to stay out there. Mm. Because part of the migration process, they had to invest in a business and run the business. And she was the only one who spoke English because she had lived in England. Mm. She had fantastic English. Mm. But we grew apart because I was still in China working. And uh, well, that ended. And then did you continue to stay? Like I continued to stay in Zhuhai, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, went, I went on the dating scene and I did so well. Yeah. So well. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Six four, <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyes, yeah. <laughs> Right, well, <laughs> proper poster boy there, yeah. For <laughs> 1930s Germany, yeah. <laughs> I was, oh, they were yeah. extremely well. So where does wrestling fit into that then? Okay, comedy show is how wrestling began, believe it or not, with my ex in Shenzhen. I heard about this. Yes, let's, let's so tell I us. went into a comedy show in Shenzhen. Uh, I was with my ex-girlfriend, the one who ran off to Australia. <laughs> 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 I went to a comedy show and... And it was an Indian guy who lived in Hong Kong. He was one of the acts. And we sit there. And he's going on the crowd. And you know he's making comments about different people in the crowd. And he's like, oh, whoa, whoa. He says, Hulk Hogan's in the crowd. <laughs> pointing at myself. And uh, he carried on. And during the set, I went to the bathroom. And as I came out, I, I could hear the room going silent. And everyone's staring at me. <laughs> and I, could, I overheard him talking to my girlfriend like in the crowd and she was shouting back something and he was shooting her down with some jokes and i came out of the bathroom i looked at my verses and i just shook my head like <laughs> i went back to the bathroom and the whole place started laughing yeah right yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe that was a sign yes play to the crowd anyway after the show the 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 comedians are saying goodbye to everybody and i shook his hand i said hey you made that hulk hogan reference he says yeah i said I said, oh, I said, I love the wrestling. I said, I'd love to find the wrestling. He says, yeah, why, why, why aren't you involved with the Hong Kong wrestling scene? I was like, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. He says, oh, sometimes I do ring announcing for them. I said, I'm going to ask you straight. I said, I'm not going to like sweet talk. I said, please put me in contact. Mm. Like, like, could you give me the contact? And he gave me the contact of the wrestler Ho Ho Lun. And I spoke to Ho Ho Lun. He came over to Shenzhen across the border and we met and we got talking. And then he put me through to the Slam, who won the MP oh, right. championship last night. No, yes. The Slam was one of the guys who got the first ever wrestling ring in China. Right. And the Slam at first didn't believe I was a foreigner when I messaged him, because I messaged in Chinese. Right. Ho Ho told me he doesn't have great English. <laughs> and so, like, you know, even when I sent a pitch, he said I could have got it off the internet. <laughs> anyway, when I finally met Ho Ho, oh, sorry, the Slam later, it was a month later at a Hong Kong WF show. He was like, oh, well, now I've seen you, I could put the, you know, a face to the name. Yes. And then he invited me to go and train in Dongguan in Champing area where he had the ring set up in a gym. And so I went there to do wrestling. And that's where, because I had a year, I did a year and a half in England, but I had a few years of doing no wrestling right. when I first came to China. And then I got settled back in. So, you know, they say shake off the ring rust. Yes. Getting back into it, learning the steps. And then I learned that he's learned wrestling very different from the wrestling I had learned. Right. And he didn't know my style of wrestling. I didn't know his. And he kept telling me I was wrong doing something. And I'm thinking to myself, am I wrong? Have I been doing it wrong all this year? Yes, yes. And then I found out from a Taiwanese wrestler who was there, who took me aside. He says, no, no, they just learned a different style. Right. And he says, the style you did is more the American, the more common style. Right. That way, yeah. 
So yeah, bit of a clash. It was because he was telling me what I was doing was wrong. Right. But and I remember like every training session back in the UK would start by doing ten front bum uh sorry, ten back bums, ten front bums, ten flip bumps and stuff like that. All right. And then every one I'm doing is like wrong, 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 and I'm thinking to myself, Really? <laughs> but but then you, you obviously you went through with that, you, you kept with it. So obviously it was something that you really wanted so to do. So everything started growing from there, but I mean this was amateurish. Right. At the lowest scale. This was almost a step up from backyard wrestling almost. So where was Chinese wrestling at that stage when you started to come back? The, it was like the baby's head's just popping out. Right. Yeah. Just like right. Born. Yeah. yeah. So there wasn't too many promotions. Was MKW no, at that stage? No, no, no. MKW came later. So this right. was like 2012, 2013. But they would have had, the slam was involved with the another slam. promotion, right? Well, in 2013, a wealthy Chinese guy said, he's going to invest a lot of money. Now, this is a big thing in China. They don't start small and grow like MKW did. A lot of promotions throw all their money in at first, make a big spectacular, then lose everything and go smaller, smaller, then disappear. They still yeah. do that, don't they? <laughs> Not just in wrestling, but in every... Yeah, that's every business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so this guy, Chinese guy came along and he made up a promotion, CNWWE, Chinese WWE. And he hired a bunch of guys, but it was an absolute, he promised you the everything, delivered nothing. Hmm. And it just you wait, just you wait. I mean, <laughs> this is this was a lie that I couldn't stop laughing about this guy. They, they nicknamed him the drunken boss because he used to drink all the time. <laughs> but he used to always say, the show must go on. And he must have learned that expression. Yeah. But all the wrestlers have walked out at him at one stage oh, the right. show, and he says, the show must go on. I'm, I'm thinking, I, I like to see how he's going to run a wrestling show with no wrestling. <laughs> Is he going to hire somebody? Yeah, the crowd. And he was like, the crowd did, with a wrestling ring with nobody backstage. Nobody. No preparation oh, or anything. Yeah. Well, and I'm I, glad that's changed for the... Well, so he, he disappeared. Right. And apparently he passed away when people were trying to get money from him. Right. So he wasn't paying wrestlers. It was just like the turning up. It was and, like basically how you would, sc the modern day of sc scamming people. Yeah. Like, no, no, I'll get this, mate, first time. And then you've built the trust. Mm. So he pays you the first time, looks after you the first couple of days. And you think, oh, this guy's treating me very well. Mm. You know, he's paying the hotel, giving me food, taking me out, paying me for my wrestling. And then after a few days, I'll get you next week. And you think, well, this guy has looked after me in the first few days. He seems very genuine. And then it slowly gets pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Yeah. Yeah. Like you more deal with somebody who is more straight to your face and just give you the cash for an order, even if you disagree on stuff or whatever. At least you're getting paid and the, the man of their word. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like that with this guy. Right. And then some of the wrestlers, I wasn't there at this time, did videos of them going into his office. And like trying to find stuff because <laughs> he really screwed over these foreign wrestlers. Yeah, right. I'm stuck in China with no payment and no flight ticket. No yeah. good. It was, and some of them went on to be in NXT in the UK. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And then Adrian, and then the Slam put me in contact with Adrian. He says, This American guy's contacted me. See if he's legit. Mm. So I spoke with Adrian. And that's when Adrian told me about his vision of MKW. Now, I just had surgery. As you see, for the people who are not seeing this, I've got this huge scar, oh. surgical scar across my chest. Now, I had just had surgery on that. Now, you're probably wondering where that came from. Mm. I used to bench very heavy, bench press, and I bench press over 400 pounds, so about 180 something kg. And one day it didn't go well. Very bad. Mm. Actually, it's the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. So I was injured, and Adrian says, "But well, I asked Adrian, can I still be part of the show? When I was wrestling, I was wrestling hungry. Taste for it. I said, put me in there. And he put me in like a bodyguard role for a Chinese wrestler. That would have given you yeah, some a chance to do your talking to the crowd and doing your you know, promos. And... and as well is the crowd we had was all Chinese. Right. And none of them were wrestling fans. Right. And I didn't think their English was that strong either. So I could, there were a lot of new guys. So I could call the match on the outside as, right. a, as a bodyguard. I could bang them out like, come on, do a suplex. Come on, bang yeah. them out like this. And we worked it off that way. 
and uh, I helped the Chinese wrestler I was working with, who he was with MKW uh, till it wasn't that last last night's show actually. I think he got married, so that kind of takes so these wrestlers away from it, and then they have to get like proper jobs and bring in real money, and that kind of kills a lot of their hobbies. And M- no, no, Black Mamba, the wrestler. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You've you've stayed with MKW for so long, and you, but you're still able to wrestle with other promotions as well how does that work are you under contract with mkw or am i getting a little bit freelance per- okay freelance i've built up trust with promoters yeah i'm old school in the way like when i deal with these people i, I said if you're fair with me i'm fair with you mm. i'll be honest with you you be honest with me yeah i said tell me what you can do for me and i'll tell you what i say here this is what i want tell me if that's possible i mean i was like i'm going to shanghai in march mm. And the promoter came back to me and says, this is running my first show up in Shanghai. And he says straight, he says, I don't have much money, Sam, really on budget. I said, I'll work with you on it. You're a friend of mine. Let's see what we can do. And he came up with a fee and he came up with the expenses. And I said, I'll take it. For you, I'll take it. Yeah. And it's his first show. And hopefully I feel like if I help this show become a success, then later on, Hopefully, that hasn't happened much to me, for me to yeah. be honest. Actually, I don't get that joy. Hmm. But yeah, I, I like to think that maybe one day, if you throw enough mud at the wall, some of hmm. it will stick. But some, a new promotion is always good. So we actually ran a promotion before in Shenzhen. Right. But now they've rebranded. And they only ran one show hmm. in 2021. In the thick of COVID. Oh, right. Yeah, that's tough. It did did well with the crowd, to be fair to them. Mm. But now they're doing this one in Shanghai, and they're working with another promotion, and I think it's a direct 50-50 split. Mm. It's interesting. It is interesting. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Good question. Like The guy who used to give me a lot of good advice was my father. He was the guy I used to always go to. Sometimes he used to tell the things I didn't want to hear. Obviously, it was never... Never, when you're especially a young man and you're making every single mistake in your life or you think you know the world and then you absolutely know nothing. Something I do take on board is I look after myself first now. Well, I'm not, I don't have a wife or kids at the moment. Maybe the, my priorities have changed. But I take care of myself first before I can take care of other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as long as I say, be good to yourself, treat yourself right, I keep myself healthy. And also the best one I like is, and I know this is the biggest cliche, is treat people how you want to be treated. And I know some people probably roll their eyes and God, I've been hearing that since, you know, whatever. But when you as an expat, I travel around the world and people are like, well, oh, how are there people in that country, other people in that country? Generally, the genuine people I meet outside of tourist areas where like you might come across scammers who might give you a bad impression of the place. If you're good with people, they're very good with you. Yeah. And that's what I found when I've traveled around. Yep, yeah, that's that's a great quote. So the problem is when you're a wrestler who plays an absolute terrible <laughs> person and I'm shouting insults at the crowd and giving abuse. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes after the show when I do see them and they say, yeah. Oh, you you're not the guy out there that, yes. that's a character. That's a character. Yeah. You know, sometimes the fans But people don't know that. Yes, but sometimes there's wrestlers who also <laughs> stay in character for too long. So yes. That's true. But, and social media, Sam. Where can we find you uh, for our international and for our... Okay, this is perfect for everybody because as a marketing manager, one thing I like to do is keep everything consistent. So my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, I'm not going to talk too much on Facebook. That's more for family, but Instagram, Twitter, I'm very active on. You'll find me at SJD, uh, my family name's Burgess, so S-J-D-B-U-R-G-E-S-S. Samuel John David Burgess is my original full name, so I use SJD and then Burgess all together. So as of today, who are your top two or three favorite bands of all time? In the 90s, I got my friends started playing the guitar, and then we started getting the CDs. And we got the Black Album, I think it's called, by Metallica. The actual album is just called Metallica, but they call it the Black Album, yes. Three uh, movies all time. American History X. Definitely mm, in my top That's list. a good one. Yeah. Okay, if it means something to me, Jurassic Park. Interesting. Because I watched that as a kid in 1993. My parents took me to the cinema. 
Mm. And when I left the cinema, I was really upset. And my parents said, why? And I said, because that thing, that place will never exist in real life. And yeah. I used to love dinosaurs as a kid like most young boys did. Got it. Yeah, I love dinosaurs. Jurassic Park. Training Day with Denzel Waffle. Oh, yes. Was always a, was all, yes. I used to, when I was a teenager, I used to make a lot of those references in the movie. Yes, uh, yeah, yes. You know, well, 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 late teens it would have been. Yeah. But I don't think that's a good choice. American History X, I think, is a strong selection. Yes. Yeah. Training Day, yeah, it's very more, I, I, I wouldn't say that was cult level, but I mean, that, you, you got to know your movies to like mm. that. I mean, Shawshank Redemption was is oh, always going to be short to the heart. Yeah, yeah. Like my dad passed away last year, and they had some of the music from uh, oh, that, that movie. movie playing oh, yeah, right. yeah. Who's your greatest influence slash hero, and why? Okay, so I've just been sent the signed shirt of this guy. Growing up, he was an idol of mine, and I think he's become a good ambassador. And when I've mentioned his name, when people ask where I'm from in the world, and they talk about this guy, and when I say, "Oh, I'm." F- either from this country, whatever, they jump to this man, is David Beckham. Mm. Now, all the generations might be like, oh, that bloody guy, he's a show off and that. I think he's become such a good representative of the United Kingdom. He promoted as well for the Olympics in 2012 for England. I was in Macau at the Londoner Casino, and they have the David Beckham suite. Did you see the Netflix? Uh... I did I see the Netflix, yeah. So Marie, the manager, we do that, that scene where Victoria Beckham's sitting and saying, I'm from a working class Right. (laughs) Now, I do that with Marie when I see her uh, over-exaggerating stuff. Right. I'll say, no, (laughs) tell the truth. Didn't you dare ever roll? And then she gives the answer, I'm like, I do the Beckham for me. He goes, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I... I think that that Netflix was really, uh, uh, really good. I enjoyed it. It I changed really... my opinion on him. Like, I think it changed the opinion on a lot of people. Mm. David Beckham. I think he is such a good ambassador, and like he has. Okay, when he was younger, we were talked about it. You all think you're Superman, Invincible, but it's how you become when you're older as well. And I think he's a, he's a good father. Yeah. Very much loves his kids. Very much a strong family man. He's. I think he has conservative values. Mm. I. I. So when you say a role model on that, I would, I'm not ashamed to say Beckham. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd say David Beckham. He My the... father had always been number one because I knew him. He gave me life advice. He helped me some of the toughest times in my life. You probably wouldn't be in China if I wasn't for your dad, right? Exactly. And yeah. Some advice people have, uh, sorry, some, a lot of people came to me for advice, like a bit of an agony aunt. And the advice I give, I sometimes think, God, I'm just like my daddy. You know, some of the advice I'd say, hmm. you know, I'll say stuff like my dad, you say, Sam, you made this mistake. He says, I'll stand with you, but I'm not going to stand in front of you. You know, mm. stuff like, and I use that line. I thought, God, that's, that's, that's my dad's the only person who ever said that line to me. Yeah. You know, I'll stand with you. I'm not going to stand. Big Sam, well, thank, thank you very much.